Right. Hello everybody, this is Leo Brady with TheMovieGuy.com. I am super excited today. I am sitting here with the writer and director of her amazing, really like quite breathtaking, tense film, Birth Rebirth. This is director Laura Moss. Laura, thank you so much for being with me here today. So um, a question I typically like to ask um, when I start these interviews is how were you introduced to movies growing up and what was sort of the spark for you to say, you know, sitting in a the theater and say, hey, I'd like to do that one day? Oh man, I mean, I've always been into horror and yeah. I'm one of four kids, so my parents didn't have time to supervise all of us. So I watched a lot of like really intense horror at a very young age. Yeah. And recently someone asked me this question, like what was the movie, you know, and I think, for, like for a lot of people, what well, the first movie I saw in theaters that kind of blew my mind was Pulp Fiction. Awesome. But the first thing that I saw that made me think about how something was shot was actually an old Twilight Zone episode called The Eye of the Beholder. If anyone remembers it, it's like, you know, someone's disfigured in an accident and, you know, they have plastic surgery to become beautiful and when they unwrap themselves, they're sort of like a hideous alien and you realize that the standard of beauty is different on this planet but you realize that you haven't seen anyone's face during the whole episode, that they filmed it in such a way that you don't notice that you that you didn't see their faces. And it definitely had, it was this like light bulb moment of like, oh, this visual storytelling occurs on multiple levels. Yeah, yeah that's interesting too. I, I kind of grew up watching old Twilight Zone episodes. It was like the Twilight Zone and the Three Stooges, yeah. back to back episode. Like it was like always just so odd. Um, that, that, that's always like amazing to me. It's like everybody that answers this question typically says like, in some ways my parents were taking me to movies that I shouldn't be seeing. And, and I have a five-year-old uh, to give you a little bit of backstory about me. Um, and I often have moments where I'm like, I think I'm going to let him watch Alien at the age of like nine or 10 because I'm like, either, either I'm going to scare him to make him like feel it <laughs> or I'm going to like... Uh, wait too long and I don't want to I don't want to miss my moment I think you know it's about where, what the kids interest level is yeah. I mean I inflicted horror upon my little brothers against their will yeah. but I was just seeking it out and I'm you know I'm not a parent so it's easy for me to talk about this but I'm like I, I really believe in like if, if you can be there to show it to a kid and provide context right. I think that's the most amazing thing yeah well um, uh, before you had made very short six total uh, and you've had great success in that format, um, but what sort of spark hit for you to finally say, all right, I'm ready to do a full-length feature? Well, I think like a lot of filmmakers, I would have, I said I'm ready to do a full-length feature a long time ago, yeah. um, and the industry has to then allow for that. Yeah. Um, this has been a long journey. I mean, uh, I, we started writing this about six years ago, my writing partner and I. Yeah. Uh, we got into the Sundance Screenwriting Labs in 2020, and then we were slated to make this film in the summer of 2020, and unfortunately there was a global pandemic. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so it's been a long process. And those two extra years from like being greenlit to filming were obviously frustrating, but I think there was some benefit to sitting in my room and thinking about the movie for a long time before yeah. having to make it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, like everybody, it's interesting to hear people's stories about the pandemic, about how their creative juices were able to sort of get going. I mean, I, I wanna I I wanna dig into this film. It is fascinating, it's intense. Um, where did this concept come from? How were you able to turn turn it into this final product? Yeah, I mean I've been thinking about it this idea in some shape or form since I first read Frankenstein as like a young teenager yeah. and you know before reading Frankenstein all of the things that I had read by women in school were about marriage and manners they were Jane Austen or the Bronte sisters and I just didn't connect with them and when I read Frankenstein and then I learned about Mary Shelley and her life um, you know like many miscarriages and the loss of children she suffered and the grief she she dealt with early in life it felt obvious to me that this Victor Frankenstein should be a woman and I kept waiting for someone else to do it I was like oh this is gonna you know this yeah. is obvious <laughs> uh, but I you know I didn't really see it done the way that I had thought of it in my mind. And, and so many like iterations too right like Kenneth Branagh like the original yeah. James Whale stuff right yeah to me it was really interesting the idea of a female character who 
um, wants to create life with her mind, but in a lot of ways has to reckon with her own body to do it. You know, what does it mean to intellectually create life when you actually create and gestate life with your body? Yeah. Yeah, th- this is an interesting sort of segue. I mean, I, I, I like to be personal with the people I'm interviewing. My, my son is born from IVF, and, like, it was such a grueling, rough process for my wife, and, like, I don't think we talk about that enough, and I think, like, this movie fully captures sort of a different type of loss and a different type of meaning of what it means to be a parent and what it means to sort of um, want to have a child. Uh, can you sort of even talk about I don't want to say it's like the politics of it but I think like there's a lot of powerful subtext there's a lot of you know powerful stuff going on here about these two characters Uh, they seem to be a yin and yang of like of what might be expected of women yeah I mean uh, the film is about two women kind of co-parenting a reanimated child one of whom is the child's biological mother and the other is a Dr. Frankenstein yeah Um, And I think for me it was important to try to take two characters, I know, okay, taking it back. (laughs) For me, uh, I wrote this with Brendan in, we wrote it in our 30s, and everyone around us was talking about motherhood and parenthood. Whether to do it, when to do it, struggles with making it happen, you know, what is it going to do to my career? And I felt very much that uh, there was a lot of judgment someone who had made one choice tended to judge someone who made another choice about having children. Right. So I was really interested in these two characters, one that kind of represents a career obsession and one who represents kind of a motherhood obsession, um, and really exploring the ways in which they were similar or which, or the ways in which their motivations intertwine. Yeah. Yeah, well, and you have, I mean, seriously, two excellent actors here in your lead with Judy Re- Reyes and Marin Ireland, and... I had seen Marin Ireland in a few horror movies before this, and like, so I already, I pretty much knew what she was capable of, but I feel like the two of them, they they do, I mean, they do such, and you want this probably from your actors, they do such a good job of staying in their lanes, yet crossing, yet intersecting. Talk about getting them on the project. Tell me, you know, do you give them notes, or is this just the two of them, they understood the text, and they, they can take it and go with it? Yeah, I mean, Judy Reyes and Marin Ireland are incredible actors. Uh, Judy, I had been thinking about from Inception, you know. I had seen her in a 2013 film called Gun Hill Road that was a drama where she was incredible. I know many people know her as Carla from Scrubs, but I knew that she she could get to the depths of this role. Right. Uh, Marin, uh, I I loved from the stage. That's really how I knew her work. But Shudder had worked with her on The Dark and the Wicked. And so they were jazzed about her too. So I was really excited to make that offer. Honestly, both women were interested from Jump, um, and that was that felt like a huge gift. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot in advance about their characters, and we made a lot of decisions before we got on set. So my notes were pretty minimal once we got there, but like both of them are really um, disciplined actors, so they really want to dig in to the text before before you're in the like insanity of production. Right. Right. Um, well, and we talked a little bit already about like themes. I'm a huge fan of of the Alien series. I'm a huge fan of Alien Covenant, and and Alien kind of went in that direction of talking about like Frankenstein and the android creating the monster in a way. Uh, you talked a little bit about it already. I mean, I assume that yes, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is your inspiration for a lot of this, but. What other inspirations did you sort of take going into it? Were, did you have any other th- thoughts of like, you know, I want to make this Cronenberg. I want to make this something different. I want to make this my own. I mean, talk about that process. I mean, uh, is it there on the page? Yeah, I mean, Cronenberg fans will see a lot of dead ringers yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Um, and that's one of my favorite movies. I think I can recite every line from that movie by heart. Yeah. So it made it in there yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but then there were a lot of references that were, you know, um, not horror references. So like, Todd Haynes is safe. Uh, is a movie that I'm obsessed with, and is like a very slow, creeping drama kind of thriller. Yeah. Um, Morvern Kalar, Lynn Ramsey's film, was one that I looked at. Um, also, just in terms of the the way to deal with like explicit content in the movie, I I was I watched and and 
unfortunately for the crew, shared with the crew this uh, Stan Brakhage documentary called The Act of Seeing with One's Own Eyes, which is literal footage of an autopsy. So we talked a lot about sort of like an unflinching camera when it came to looking at medical realities. Yeah, well, and that, I mean, that is the stuff that, for, for me, it's like, I, I'm showing how much of a wimp men can be, like, wh- some of those scenes, I'm just like, I was like, oh my god, I, I have to look away, like, there's moments of, like, cadavers and body parts, and how, tell us about the movie Magic, how do you, there's a lot of blood, there's, there's moments of that, what goes into that process of creating that on a set? Yeah, I mean, Lisa Forst is our special effects makeup artist, and she's just killer. Uh, It was really her and um, Emily Ryan, who was a a pathologist, a Stanford pathologist, who was our on-set medical advisor, um, that created that magic together. You know, we really talked about the importance of grounding um, this film in, like, medical accuracy, because the concept is fantastical and so I think really to keep the audience on board we wanted to make sure that that reality was as grounded as possible yeah. but yeah men keep fainting during this movie that happened three <laughs> times at Sundance what? and once in Minneapolis oh my god yeah, yeah. I don't know I don't think it's that that scary but. It, like, and it's like for me like this is I'm, it's pretty standard it's like I'm not like I've seen Terrifier and I've seen like the goriest of the gore so it's like so it's not that much but I think like maybe it's just the text and maybe it's just like the way that it's done where it just feels so authentic I mean I think like that's really if 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 that's what you hope from your films that's what you get here it feels very genuine and like the real article and honestly forces the audience to ask like would you want to like bring your loved one back from the dead in a more authentic way I think like there is a sense in the Frankenstein movies where you're like, okay, well, this is still made up. And I think here you kind of approach it in a very realistic, authentic way. And I think that's commendable. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. That's <laughs> yeah. really nice. I, I know that that's like the goal, right? Yeah, yeah. That is, that's, the, that's the hope. I think medical squeamishness is interesting because there's a scene with a needle. There's scenes that really aren't that violent or explicit, but I think those are the most stomach churning scenes in the movie. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, so uh, this might be coming from a man to a woman. This might be sort of a ridiculous question because it's probably asked all the time. But I do think women in horror, women directors, has taken a really awesome sort of like at least of an increase, right? Can't say that it's enough, right? It's not like there's not 100 women directors. There's maybe 20. You know what I mean? We need to keep increasing that number. But uh, I, I wrote down some names. Jennifer Kent, Nia DaCosta, Lee Janiak, Kate Dolan, somebody who also I've interviewed. She's an uh, Irish filmmaker. Um, Julia Durkinow, Nikki Atujusu, yeah. Mariama Diallo. Right. Karen Kusama. Right. Like, there's so many now, finally, right, I guess we can say. But uh, you fit right in there with them. I mean, this is really... Well, in one important way, I don't. I'm non-binary. So, okay. uh, you know, but I, I do agree with you. I think that... The, the non-male perspective in horror is um, has, has often been underserved and I know that when I was growing up I, I loved all kinds of horror and I it contributed to like a weird latent misogyny in me because I would be like women are dumb they like their high heels break and they always go in the basement and they right. do dumb shit right. and then it's like wait men wrote those women <laughs> and filmed them yeah. so like so those kinds of fleshed out portrayals of female characters I think you know we're seeing more and more of them in horror and I think that's really exciting yeah uh, and a- as you said last question as you said before um, this is your third time for the Chicago Film Critics Festival you had won the audience award for one of your short films how does it sort of feel now to bring this film back I know I know maybe the jitters got washed away a little bit at Sundance but are you starting to just enjoy this ride now, or is it still nervous every day? I'm starting to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, this festival feels like home, yeah. because I've been here before. Yeah. Uh, Sundance was amazing, but it was very nerve-wracking. Like, you know, how is it going to play? What are the reviews going to be like? You know, it was very industry-focused. Yeah. And the awesome thing about traveling with the film um, at regional festivals is, like, it's really just about talking to the audience and seeing how they feel about the movie and there's a real conversation that happens I think less so at a, at a festival like Sunday. Yeah, yeah. All right. 
Well, Ramos, this has been a great interview. I appreciate you giving me your time. Uh, Birth Rebirth is going to be out in theaters in August, and we'll see it on Shutter around the Halloween time. Congratulations, Laura Moss. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Yep.